And welcome back. Tom Harbin here with you. Uh, Crimea, Ukraine, Russia. Uh, this whole thing is very much in the news right now. And I wanted to get Dr. Stephen Cohen back, Professor Emeritus at New York University and Princeton University, contributing editor to The Nation magazine, author of the book Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives from Stalinism to the New Cold War, and his most recent cover article for The Nation, Distorting Russia, How the American Media Misrepresent Putin, Sochi, and Ukraine. Uh, get him back on and get his thoughts on what's going on. Professor Cohen, welcome back to the program. Thank you, Tom. Thank you so much for being with us. Um, first of all, you want to give us a quick recap of, uh, from your point of view of what has happened over the, over the weeks since uh, the end of the Olympics? I don't know we need to go all the way back to the Olympics. I mean, it seems like last century, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. We yeah. Were just, at that time, we were just trying to cast a uh, kind of bad aura on Putin's Olympics. Yeah. But if we go back to the time when you and I talked last, which was probably 10 days to two weeks ago, uh, things have got uh, worse and worse and worse. Mm-hmm. Let me summarize what I'm thinking and have been saying okay. uh, lately, that we are two steps from a Cuban Missile Crisis confrontation, and after that, one step to possible war. The two steps to a Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis type of con, uh, confrontation would be that if NATO, and this is being discussed in Brussels and Washington, moves its troops to the uh, Polish-West Ukrainian border, remember Poland's a member of NATO, or even into Western Poland, both are being discussed. And there's a lot of troop movements going on in that area, but we don't know exactly what they are. If that were to happen... Russia, President Putin, would almost certainly send his troops into southeastern and eastern Ukraine. So you, that would be the Cuban Missile Crisis eyeball-to-eyeball confrontation. Right. Now, is that likely to happen? At the moment, it's less likely to happen than not. But in this kind of uh, run-up to whatever comes next, uh, behavior and words, on all sides, are now escalating in a really reckless way. And you've got inside Ukraine many tails wagging this dog of war, all sorts of provocations, snipers, uh, spontaneous secessionist street demonstrations, reckless statements by the government in Kiev, which they then take back. Uh, Everybody is threatening everybody, and today... President Obama made a kind of contradictory statement in Europe. He said, we're not going to use military force to return Crimea from Russia, Russia annexed it last week, back to Ukraine. But we're worried that Russia is going to move further militarily. Therefore, we're mobilizing our forces in Europe. So that's the NATO trigger that I'm talking about. Uh, What I do not hear coming from Washington, is any sense of diplomatic initiative. Meanwhile, however, the Russians have offered on March 17th, since we talked last, Tom, a very interesting kind of talking points for the beginning of negotiations. So to end and complete this summary, it may be that somewhere that you and I don't know about, wise people representing all the parties are sitting down and having a serious discussion. But the public discourse, particularly now coming out of Europe and Washington, shows no interest in this Russian proposal for specific talking points to begin negotiations. Wow. And what would those talking points be? I know. I wish I had written them down because I read them in Russian from the Russian Foreign Ministry website. Mm. But let me kind of generalize. Russia is calling for the creation of what it calls a contact group. That is a kind of super diplomatic uh, group of uh, the United States, the European Union, and Russia, and that it would strive for the following. New elections in Ukraine for both the president and the parliament. Secondly, a moderate or non-aligned Ukrainian government in Kiev that would not ever, because this is Putin's red line, join NATO. That's the big issue. Thirdly, this is somewhat more technical for political scientists, but important politically. 
a new Ukrainian constitution that would create a federation. At the moment, Ukraine is a unitary state. For example, the governors of the Ukrainian regions are appointed by the president. They're not elected, as our governors are, by the regions or the states. Russia wants this because a large part of Ukraine is pro-Russian, ethnically Russian, Russian-speaking. They tend to be concentrated in the southeast and the east. And Russia's proposing that for them and for the pro-European regions in the west, there'd be a federation which would give these areas more autonomy. Now, there's a danger there. One has to negotiate that, how much autonomy. Right. That's the general proposal, and that this would be, if agreed, and I think this is very important, ratified by the United Nations Security Council. In other words, Russia's willing to take this to the United Nations. Now, just briefly, because I'm sure anybody is going to ask, as presumably uh, Obama and Kerry did if they paid any attention, what is Putin willing to give in return? And here I think the following. That first of all, he would recognize this new government of, of Ukraine. He which he, which he does not know. He does not. He, he considers the new government to have come to power through a mob, street-driven coup d'etat against the elected president. That's his view. And in some ways, it's certainly understandable in legal terms. Yeah. So that he would give recognition, and recognition would include Russian guarantee of Ukraine's political and territorial sovereignty which means, to dot the I, that Russia would not inspire or provoke or take advantage of all this pro-Western secessionist um, sentiment that is in Ukraine even after Crimea was taken away. There's still a lot of secession, secessionist sentiment in the East. And, and other things that I think, I mean, too technical, but it is, to my way of thinking, it's, where, it's enough to sit down and talk. And if they meet each other halfway, we get out of this worst crisis in 50 or 60 years. So I think the ball is now, I don't like this analogy, but it is now in Washington's court. It's in the White House. It's in Obama's hands now. Right, right. And he's got all these forces to deal with from John McCain and Lindsey Graham screaming at him on the one hand. That's to... really an important point. And, but it, it's a twofold point. Uh, were Obama to arouse himself, to leadership that, frankly, he hasn't shown in international affairs previously, but to historic leadership, and to say, you know, there's two sides to every story, and there's a point. Maybe we cross red lines in Ukraine. Maybe this really is something of a grave concern to Russia from its national security point of view. And we're going to try to find a compromise. If he were to do that, all manner of wrath would descend upon his head, not only from our hawkish Democrats and Republicans. But in this general toxic atmosphere of anti-Putin, Russophobic, uh, uh, almost hatred that's emerged in Washington now, though, and this is very important, our media calls Putin an autocrat. Now, an autocrat means a despot with all power. That is, the autocrat makes all decisions. That is not Putin's situation. He has survived uh, 14 years in power because he's many and micromanaged conflicting groups in the Russian political league, financial, political, ideological groups. And take my word for this, there is a group or more that is much more hard-lined toward the West than Putin. Putin doesn't hate the West. Putin's not anti-American. These people are, and they are now speaking up loudly. So he's more like uh, Franklin Roosevelt trying to walk down the middle where Roosevelt had fascists on one hand and communists on the other, literally in the 1930s. Maybe that's an imperfect analogy. All I, I mean, I've got to think about that, but all I want to say is, is that we assume in this country that there is no politics in Putin's political elite. Hang on just a second. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Hold that thought, please, Professor Cohen. We'll be right back. It's 15 minutes past the hour. We're talking with Professor Steve Cohen. We're talking with Professor Stephen Cohen, Professor Emeritus at NYU in Princeton, um, author, contributing editor to The Nation, thenation.com, 
uh, Nation Magazine, author in the nation of Distorting Russia, and also author of the book, The uh, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives. Uh, Professor Cohen, you were saying. Uh, uh, the emeritus in my title means I'm old. It's a polite way of saying an old guy. Okay. But I have been around this subject uh, as a scholar, and as somebody who's lived in Russia many years. This question of how uh, authoritarian Russian politics works, and since Stalin, there has never been a leader of Russia who's had despotic power. Mm. The leader has always had to take into account uh, groups to the leader, so to speak, soft and hard side. Now, in this case, when you look back over Putin's 14 years in power, as the Russian political elite does, it sees something we don't see. It sees Russia, Putin, making one concession after another to the West and getting as Putin said, betrayed. In his speech, when he formally, on I think March 18th, when he formally announced the annexation of Crimea, referring to the United States, he said they have lied to us so many times, meaning we, our government, has broken its word. So now, as conceivably, these two leaders, Putin and Obama, decide we've got to negotiate our way out of this danger of war. If they do it, Obama is going to have to be bold, resolute, strong, decisive. So is Putin, because some people who have called him an appeaser of the West in the past are going to say, you can't believe a word or a commitment that the United States makes. We hold all the cards now, and they do, and now is the time for a reckoning. We will so, reckon with these people once and for all. So Putin has his own John McCain's and Lindsey Graham's to his right, and they may be even more powerful than the ones that Obama has here in the United States. Is that the essence of what you're saying? I would go farther. I would say they're a lot smarter. They know more, and they have more influence at the high level than do McCain and Graham. McCain and Graham say preposterous things that bear no relationship to reality in Russia, and they do symbolically idiotic things. What in the world McCain was doing in November and December on that square in Kiev, embracing a political leader whom the European Union had denounced as anti-Semitic and racist? Why did McCain just not know who he was? In which case he ought to resign from the Senate because he doesn't know what he's doing. If he knew, it's, there's no word for it. We don't embrace neo-fascists, even if we hate the other side, Russia, as McCain obviously does. No, these people, these people in the Russian political establishment are serious people. Ideology, ideologically, they're dangerous, but they know what they're talking about, they know how to make arguments, and they have tremendous influence. Yeah. Where do the, it would, in 20 seconds here, where do the oligarchs come down in this? Uh, I mean, there are a lot of oligarchs, and I mean, after all, if we freeze their assets, it means the New Jersey Nets are up for sale because it's owned by the, the uh, Russian oligarch. Okay. But basically, they are controlled by Putin because he controls their assets and their ca cash flows, even if they're deposited in Europe. So it's kind of the opposite of the United States, where the Koch brothers and other oligarchs here control our political system. In Russia, the political system controls the oligarchs. I would say, no, I would say that the oligarchs do play an enormous role controlling the Russian political system, but not essential foreign policy. I see. Okay. We'll continue this conversation in just a moment. Uh, Professor Stephen Cohen with us. We'll be right back. And Professor Stephen Cohen, Professor Emeritus at NYU and Princeton University, contributing editor to The Nation, thenation.com, author in The Nation of Distorting Russia, and author of the book, uh, uh, Soviet Fates and Lost Alternatives, From Stalinism to the New Cold War. And uh, Professor Cohen, I wanted to get your thoughts on the IMF. The IMF is offering this uh, loan package, uh, or apparently is preparing to offer a loan package to Ukraine, um, uh, Dr. Michael Hudson, who is an economist with the uh, University of Missouri, uh, said, and I quote, the, IMF, the objective of IMF loans is to deindustrialize economies. Uh, the Westerners want to buy the Ukrainian farmland. They want to buy the Ukrainian public utilities. They want to buy the roads. They want to buy the ports. 
And all of this is going to be sold at a very low price to the Westerners, and the price that the Westerners pay will be turned over to the Ukrainian government, which will then turn it back to the IMF uh, to repay the loans. So whatever the West gives Ukraine will immediately be taken back. What do you think about that? Well, I don't have enough knowledge, uh, and Dr. Hudson might be right. To me, it sounds like it contains an element of truth, but it's overstated. What we do know for sure, and this happened in Russia and in other countries, that when a loan from the IMF is accepted, it comes with conditions. And they're called austerity conditions. And the first people hurt are the people who receive federal salaries and pensions, largely older people. Uh, it also means that subsidized businesses, whether they're subsidized by rent by the government or energy supplies, shut down. So unemployment ensues. Uh, Western influence whether it's wise or unwise, whether it's benign or rapacious, grows tremendously because it now holds the debt, uh, billions of dollars, of this country. Generally speaking, uh, I think IMF involvement in these kinds of situations has been bad for those countries. Uh, but what's interesting here is you'll notice the figure they're banding about, $15 billion. That's because Putin in November offered uh, Ukraine, $15 billion to keep it from the financial precipice. And Has that been delivered? Well, he delivered the first part, which I think was $3 billion. Mm. But in addition, he offered something potentially more valuable, a one-third discount on natural gas. Ukraine lives on Russian nat natural gas. One-third would mean billions and billions of dollars savings to Ukraine a year. As soon as this crisis began, when the Russian, pre uh, the, excuse me, the Ukraine... Ukrainian President Yanukovych was overthrown on February 2nd. Russia closed down those loans, pulled back that offer. But I, I neglected to say, when we were speaking earlier, about what Putin might do in a negotiated step settlement, if he got, got at a significant part of what he wanted, I think he might make a contribution to Ukraine's economic recovery. It would be in Russia's interest to do so for various reasons. The easiest thing for him to do would not to be giving them cash or loans, but simply to revert to his offer of a one-third discount on natural gas. And that would be easy to do. And I think the Russians would do that if we meet them halfway. But again, I see no movement in that direction in Washington or in Brussels. And now, how does the, the this $10 billion deal that Yanukovych negotiated with Chevron to to frack natural gas out of Ukraine. Uh, you know, uh, I've, I've read stories suggesting that Ukraine could become gas independent if, uh, if this is successful. It's a year or two down the road, but they'd end up being like North Dakota, you know, the new, the new Texas uh, and Oklahoma of the late 19th century kind of thing. I know. Everybody thinks that fracking and shale gas is the road to prosperity. But first of all, it leaves out the, the, the technological consequences of fracking isn't very well known yet. Right. We'll see what comes. Secondly, it's very expensive. Ukraine can't do it on its own. ExxonMobil also has even more invested in Russia. Hmm. So what if Russia says to ExxonMobil, make your choice? The billions in hand with us are the billions in the bush, if you find anything. And it leaves out the political factor. Uh, Ukrainians do care about the environment. Uh, once Ukrainian society is mobilized, uh, as it is now, it could turn its ire toward, toward any manner of, of issue, including fracking. Right. So I don't think Ukraine can count on that right now. But this returns us, Tom, to your point, good point, about the role that what we loosely call oligarchs play, play in this. Bear in mind what Obama's professed strategy is, though I don't think it's even a policy. Uh, that's to bring sanctions against Russia. The only people who could effectively sanction Russia in the United States are the corporations that have gigantic investments in Russia, the Ford Motor Company, PepsiCo, uh, ExxonMobil, and many more. They're doing, they're doing very large business in Russia, and they projected even larger business. They haven't been racing to sign on to sanctions against Russia because it would shut them down in Russia. So, you know, capitalism pays a dividend in politics sometimes. Hmm. Interesting. Um, we have just, just a couple of minutes, maybe a minute and a half left. I'm curious your thoughts. We talked last time we, we had one of these long conversations about the possibility that Ukraine might actually come apart, 
that we could see a civil war there, a separation of East and West. Your thoughts on that in the, the oh, last I minute think we that's have? that's right, Tom. We are spitting distance from that. Uh, here's one of the mysteries, and if you can find anybody, uh, an English speaker who's there and might report to you, we, I, don't know what's going on in Western Ukraine. That's the, part of, that, that's the part of Ukraine that wants to join Europe. But it's also the part of Ukraine where there are many, many uh, movements of these quasi neo Nazi uh, 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 parties and organizations. That's interesting. The Talk Radio News Service that we have a, a collaboration with and we share a floor with here in D.C. has two reporters in Ukraine, but they've both been on the East and they've called into this program several times. Um, Ask but, them to go West. Okay, I'll I mean, do that. My, my wife, the editor of The Nation, is, is hoping to have somebody to go there and report. But the, our, our major news media in this country, for one reason or another, never file any reports from there. They're in Donetsk and in the Russian provinces. Of right. Maybe it's too dangerous. But bad things are happening there. But, I, but to make it more generally, obviously, here's the point. Ukraine was one time before this began one state. It's never been one country historically. It's always been at least two. One leaning toward Europe, one toward Russia. Maybe, maybe, I don't know, maybe partition to Ukraine. So right. God knows how and where you draw the map. There you go. We'll have to leave it at that. Uh, excuse, hang on. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Call 866-987-THOM. Professor Stephen Cohen, New York University and Princeton University, The Nation Magazine, thenation.com. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you so much. Good talking.